Good morning, church. Great to see you all. As uh, Bride introduced me a little bit earlier, I'm Mark, uh, lead pastor here, and it is great to be able to share God's Word uh, this morning with you. Uh, I just wanted to give a bit of a shout out as well. Uh, There's a gentleman who hasn't uh, been in church, I think, for over six months. Uh, He had a a major heart attack about six months ago, uh, and uh, I just read a message uh, from that day. Simon, which his name is, was rushed to Geelong Hospital late yesterday afternoon, suffering a massive heart attack. There's nothing more that they can really do for him. Uh, and it is they're saying that he, it will be a miracle if he survives. Simon's with us this morning, uh, which is amazing. Great to have you here, Simon. I know I came and visited you in hospital a few months back and uh, it's just so good. I know uh, many that have been praying for you in this church and, and wider as well and uh, it's, just, uh, it's just so good. Uh, God is so good and so faithful and we are so wrapped you're here with us this morning, mate. And, uh, and to Lisa as well, uh, just really yeah, continue and pray for you guys and, uh, and praise God for what God can do. Absolutely. Uh, last Thursday night, we had a men's event down on the, uh, the deck out, uh, outside uh, on the north side of the building, and it was a great, great time. We had over 80 uh, fellas from uh, this church and, and guys bringing along uh, mates and family members as well, and it was just an absolutely fantastic night, eating paella together and uh, lots of connections made with guys that have, have not met uh, each other, and, and uh, just a wonderful night. I, I know there was some great uh, feedback afterwards, except from uh, our very own senior pastor, Matt Jacoby. He, uh, he wasn't happy because the, the, the word was that we're going to have this fire, and you've heard Matt talk often about fires and these sort of bonfires that he likes to sort of create in his mind. So we advertised there was going to be these, uh, these fires and uh, it was quite underwhelming for all those guys that went along. So we had these three little barrels uh, with, uh, with wood and as Matt said, pretty much some, uh, just some toothpicks were in those, uh, in those barrels, Mark, because that, uh, that was pretty disappointing anyway. So apart from that, it was a wonderful night of, uh, of guys coming together across all generations. We had a number of young adults and and, uh, we had uh, guys there uh, older as well, which is just wonderful. Just that cross-generation mingling. Love that. All about that. It is fantastic. Uh, Today we're going to uh, look at the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew's Gospel. And uh, there's a couple of uh, passages I want to look at today. And uh, there's some parables as well that we're going to just uh, just look at and camp out for a little while because I, I love the Gospels. I love uh, the stories. I know for me, uh, I love telling stories. And if you if you know if know me for a while, uh, stories are something that I love. And, I, and something that I also love is when Jesus... Uh, tell stories. I just am fascinated and I'm always learning more. I'm always uh, picking up stuff that I've like, I've never noticed that before when I've read that. And, or someone says something, I'm like, that's amazing. So today we're going to read a familiar passage uh, from Matthew 4. And for many of us, we have maybe heard this in church. We've, re- we've read about this. But I encourage us today to lean into what God's maybe speaking to you about, what God is saying to us. Just uh, start to set the scene a little bit. So this is Jesus. He's walking along the Sea of Galilee and he sees two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. And Jesus says, come, follow me. Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. It strikes me every time I read this, and even more recently when I've been studying this, the incredible influence that Jesus had. In Matthew's Gospel, the story begins with Jesus calling out these two brothers who are simply just doing what they do. They're casting a net into the lake, a task they have done thousands upon thousands of times. It's seemingly a mundane task, but on this particular day, Jesus catches their eye. 
And he says those simple, simple words, come, follow me. I just love just the humbleness of even Jesus just walking along that lake. You can just picture it now, just humbly coming alongside a bunch of fishermen and just speaking life into their situation. Uh, we've uh, recently been talking a lot around humility. And uh, for me, coming into this church over 20 years ago, uh, there was a number of older gentlemen uh, and uh, ladies as well that, that just struck me uh, when I came to faith, of, of, especially in different prayer meetings or different occasions where I was having conversations where there was just an incredible uh, depth of faith and, and of, God's, of God's goodness upon their life. And when I've sat with them or been in prayer meetings and I've heard them pray, it's just, it's just been amazing. And there was one gentleman, uh, Stan Kennedy, and I still remember uh, and Margaret Kennedy, uh, his uh, husband, late husband, he died over uh, about 14, 15 years ago, and, and Mal, his son, and, uh, and we've got grandkids and great-grandkids of Stan here even this morning. And, and Stan was a man who, when he prayed, it was just incredible. I remember for the first time hearing him pray from the New King James and just words that I'd never heard, and it was just so powerful and, and just so incredible. And, and I then went uh, just recently when uh, we were in Q at Q Baptist where Amy and I were for five years. There was a, a gentleman there who was in the same uh, ilk of Stan, very similar uh, personality, and his name was Ken Lyle. And this man uh, was an incredible man. Many people know Gwen, Ray, uh, knew Ken, uh, and others as well through Baptist Circle. And this man, Ken, I tell you, he left a real imprint on me. He passed away a couple of years ago. And similar to Stan, when he prayed, there was a humility and a, just a depth of faith and of, of what God has done in and through. And it's just incredible to be a part of. I still remember. Uh, Actually, the last service Ken Lyle attended at Kew Baptist Church, and he was there for 70 years, the same church. And the last Sunday he was at church, uh, he, uh, the service finished, and I uh, went out the back. I had to grab a drink. And uh, most of the church uh, had attended next door to the, to the hall to grab a cuppa. Everyone sort of empties out. I go into the back of the church, and this uh, Q Baptist back hall was, hadn't been renovated or changed for like probably 70 years. It was old. And in winter, it was freezing. And I look in the back, and Ken and his wife, Edith, they're cleaning the communion cups with hot, soapy water. And he's individually he's getting each cup with a cloth and cleaning each uh, individual cup. And I looked at Ken and I said, Ken, I said, your friends and your family, they're over in the hall. Why don't you grab a cuppa? And Ken just looked at me and he said, no, Mark, I'm okay here. And it just stuck with me. You know, that was the last service that he was at, at Kew Baptist, 70 years of faithfully following and serving God. And he finished by cleaning the communion cups. I think humility is one of those things that is just incredible. And I love how Jesus calls these fishermen calls them and says, come, follow me. There's quite, something quite significant in this call. You know, the thing is, Jesus goes on to call these guys and say, hey, you're going to be out fishing for people. But what I love and what strikes me about this, he firstly calls them to himself. These two fishermen. You know, what's so special about these two fellas? Jesus chooses these two not because of anything they have done. They are not qualified. Far from it. They are ordinary, just plain, ordinary fishermen. Their insignificance is what qualifies them. The world's idea of what signifies importance or privilege is not God's. We see an example of this in, in who Jesus calls to come and follow him. This says so much more about God. Jesus is outworking God's very nature. He calls us to himself as well. For some today, you may never have experienced this God who calls you to himself. Well, today I encourage you to open your heart for what God may be showing you through his word.
We read in Matthew 4, Jesus reaches out to the fishermen who are actually busy doing something. They've got a role. It's quite random in a lot of ways. Why these two? Shortly after this, he also calls another two. But it just seems so strange and random. They're undeserving in lots of ways. But Jesus says, come and follow me. You know, if you read the, the book of Matthew, uh, this conversation that, Matthew, uh, that Jesus has uh, with those fishermen, it's actually the first conversation, the first uh, communication that, uh, that Jesus has with anyone. You know, it shows that Jesus is no solo operator, that yes, he's on a mission, that he has a task, that he's going to also bring people along for the ride. And these people that he brings are just ordinary. They're nothing special. Jesus is drawing people close. And the people he draws close represent God's unstoppable power. But this power is quite different to the power that often the world can see. Often when we talk about power, we think of status and money, possessions and success. And again, that's why I tell those stories of those who have gone before us. And there are still even those even within this church and other churches that that humility, that they're not uh, clinging to to power and success through wealth and money. And uh, it's, it's their relationship with Christ, the fact that they can serve him for all of their days. That is incredible. But today I want to talk just about what happens at the end of people's lives. As much as we celebrate that and I talk about uh, Stan, I talk about Ken and others, that we stand on the shoulders of those giants. But I want to talk about how God starts things because I find that so fascinating as well. Or even today it might be restart for you. You might be here this morning and say, you know what, I want to restart I need to restart my relationship with God. Beginnings in the kingdom of God start with belonging. And belonging to God starts in such a small, somewhat elusive, subtle way. You could easily miss it or think, no, that's not right. That's not how God works. But small beginnings The calling of the disciples that we've just read. Jesus calls his followers to come and follow me. He draws them near. He invites them close. He invites them to himself. You might be here this morning and thinking, I can't follow God. I want to get some things right in my life. You know, you may be here this morning and think, you know what, I've hurt some people. Or you might be even here this morning and go, you know what, I'm so hurt myself. You've forgot a heavy heart, it hurts, it's painful. You may even be here this morning and may have some physical pain. Your heart is heavy, your heart is hurt. Again, Jesus' words, it says, come, follow me. It starts with a heart gesture. That heart gesture we also read in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 9 where Jesus uh, arrives at a town and uh, a bunch of men uh, bring a paralysed man who's lying on a mat. When Jesus sees their faith, he says, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. It's an incredible story. I love that story in Matthew 9. Again, we see the nature of God outworked in Christ. The fact that he, this paralysed man had a physical need. Yes, there's a physical need there that's obvious. But what does he say? What does he start with? Jesus says, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. He focuses on what the, the heart. He draws near to the brokenhearted. He heals this paralysed man later. But he doesn't heal him first. He invites him in. He goes for the heart. So, so amazing. Jesus knows when we are vulnerable. He knows that so often our hearts can go astray. But our hearts belong to God, folks. I'll ask you a question this morning. How much Jesus... How much Jesus is in your heart today? How much 
Jesus is in your heart today. That word in Matthew 9 that Jesus says to the paralyzed man, take heart, son, that word may be for you this morning. It may be take heart, daughter, your sins are forgiven. You know, I want to go back to the idea of belonging to a loving God. The picture of how the kingdom of God works, we see in Jesus later on in the parables as well. In Matthew 13, and and feel free to read these for yourself. There is hidden truths in these parables. There's a number of parables that Jesus told. And there's six in particular uh, that I I find quite amazing. Because what is in all of these six stories, and I think we've got it on the screens here, the objects that are used, they're quite insignificant. They're quite small. They're things you use to describe what the kingdom is like. Jesus uses these things to describe what the kingdom is like. He firstly starts with a farmer who planted good seed in his field. A mustard seed planted in a field. Yeast used by a woman. Treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. A pearl merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. A fishing net that is thrown into the water. All of those things, seeds, yeast, treasure, pearls, fishing nets, they're all just mundane, simple, ordinary things that Jesus focuses us. We can draw from these parables. We can draw so much from these. God's nature is for us to lean in, is for us to draw near to him. You know, often when Jesus told these parables, they were a little bit cryptic. They didn't make a lot of sense. But often what would happen, those who are near to Christ, those who are his closest followers, they would follow up afterwards. And if you read Matthew 13 for yourself, you'll see time and time again where those followers say to Jesus, Can you explain more? Help me understand what's happening here with this. Jesus loves that. He loves it when we ask more questions. We see Jesus' gentle way. He doesn't rebuke when we ask questions. What is he doing in this? When we're asking these questions, we're experiencing God, folks. We experience his intimacy. We experience his closeness. We draw near. That is what following Christ looks like. We experience him. Now, sometimes people ask me, I didn't grow up in church at all. I came to this church when I was in my early 20s, came to faith. And uh, sometimes I do have people that uh, know me from uh, my high school days, and they sometimes ask me about uh, God, and, uh, and I love the opportunity as much as sometimes it can come across weird, but I love that I belong to God. I love that I belong to God because of Jesus and what he did on the cross. I can know God's love, and you can know God's love too, and you can have hope, because, and you can have security in him. As well, Jesus promises to change our lives. And he continues to change our lives. He continues to promise to change our lives. I know for me, when I think of what God has done, he makes me a better man, a better father, pastor, brother, husband, and friend. When I want to hold a grudge against someone, he calls me, to forgive. When I want to give up, he calls me to follow him, to learn how to trust him. When I want to serve my own needs and do what I want to do, serve my desires, he calls me to lay down my life and serve. My experience the last 20 years, and maybe you've had a different experience Maybe that hasn't been your experience. You know, again, this morning I mentioned the fact that you may need to start or you may want to restart saying yes to Jesus, to come to him and follow him. 
You know, so often I want to lead my own life, but man, God does such a better job, doesn't he? When we come to him, when we say, hey, I want to follow you, I have had to learn and relearn so many times that he's in charge. When I look at my 45 years of life, gee, I've done some dumb things, made some mistakes. Man, God's gracious, eh? He's kind. Come and follow me. It doesn't grow old. You might be sitting there going, oh, yeah, I've heard this before, but it doesn't grow old. It doesn't grow old. The simple gesture to follow God may mean just like the fishermen, you may need to leave some stuff behind. You may need to leave some hurts, some disappointments, some heartaches, some hopes that you were hanging your hat on. You may need to leave some stuff behind. But it starts with you saying yes to God. He's drawing near, folks. He comes close. And he says, follow me. I'm going to invite our team back up. Thanks, guys. Today, you may be here and you need a word of encouragement to take heart. Just as Jesus spoke to that paralysed man, and said, take heart, son. You need to come and, and just allow God just to speak into your hurts, into your pain. His love and forgiveness is available for you. That's why he went to the cross, so that you would know life, that you could have life, that you could have freedom, that you could have forgiveness. Acknowledge him today because he forgives. He hasn't changed. I'm going to ask you to please stand this morning. I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes and I'm going to pray a prayer. And then we're going to lead be led by our team behind and we're going to sing a song uh, to God and just worship Him. When we sing and we worship together, there's some powerful words in this song and you may have not really sang words before. Maybe you've just let the words sort of just be around and on the screen. Well, I encourage you to open your heart. And when we, when we worship together, I encourage you to even open your hands to God and say, come, I'll follow you. But let's pray. God, we thank you that your love is available and you forgive us. You are going after our hearts and we thank you for that this morning. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you that you draw near. Lord, we ask that you change our hearts, God. And we come to you with open hands this morning. We let stuff go, our pain, our hurts, our disappointment, our shame, and we ask God for you to come. We know you draw near. We know that's your nature, God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for that great reminder again this morning that you call us. You call those that are just ordinary, those that are just sometimes even not expecting it, Lord. But God, you draw us to yourself and we thank you for that. And we take heart in that today. Receive that today our prayer to you, that we again say, God, come. Holy Spirit, come. Minister to those in this place that need a touch from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.